Hello, fellow Rebel Capitals. Hope you're well. So, I'm completely changing my investment strategy moving forward. Kind of. Here's what I'm doing. Most of you have been watching my videos for quite some time, and you know that I like to set up my portfolio in something I call a 10-80-10. And that just means that 10% is allocated to insurance, and this would be gold. The other 10% is allocated to speculative assets, and I just consider something a speculative asset that doesn't pay me to own it. A good example is when I think there's asymmetry, something's cheap, uranium, would fit into that category, maybe the gold miners. And then the other 80% would be investments. And I define that as something that pays me to own it. So like a rental property with positive cash flow, it would be a dividend paying stock. Let's say you bought Exxon during the Cerveza sickness and it's paying an eight or 9% dividend yield. Uh, in fact, I was looking at Volkswagen the other day is paying five or 6%, something like that. So this would be, this would go into the investment bucket for George Gammon. And then outside of that, there's some other parameters like to buy things when they're cheap, sell them when they're expensive. And then also going back to my favorite investor of all time, Jim Rogers, we like to buy panic and sell hysteria. And the, the more I learn about markets, the more I do these videos daily, the more I do the whiteboards, the more it becomes crystal clear to me how big of a driver emotion story, in other words, narrative, is to price action of all assets. In fact, this morning I did a whiteboard video that'll come out later this week on the price of gold. And you sit there and ask yourself why it's going up. The, the answer that you just come to is there's more buyers than sellers. <laughs> I know it sounds amateurish, but that's the reality because it's not an inverse correlation with the dollar. Uh, I thought it was geopolitical. I'm mean, obviously it could be geopolitics. You can't eliminate any one of these variables, but you also can't say that over time there's a consistent correlation. So as an example, if you look at the first Gulf war, gold really didn't move that much. Nine 11, same type of setup. You can say, well, negative real rates. That doesn't really hold up under scrutiny. Inverse relationship to the dollar? No. CPI inflation hedge? Absolutely not. It's just people cherry pick the 1970s and they see this correlation of gold going up in the CPI and they think that just moving forward indefinitely into the future, this means gold is an inflation hedge. Now, over long periods of time, does it maintain its purchasing power? Well, absolutely. But it doesn't necessarily mean that if we have a, a decade of high inflation or a decade of low inflation, there's going to be a correlation with the price of gold. So again, since there's no real consistencies, no common denominators, you have to come to the conclusion that it's simply more buyers than sellers. Now, uh, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag because I did have a base case that was, I think, rather unique and that would explain most likely why the price of gold is going up but I'm going to save that for the whiteboard video. You'll have to tune in. But getting back to the topic of this video specifically, what I have done is uh, for Rebel Capitals Pro, I know a lot of you are members in there. You know that I've got a model portfolio that's been very basic. And and oh, by the way, going back to that 10-80-10 portfolio, that strategy I employ, and this isn't investment advice. I'm just telling you what I do. I also like to employ something that I actually learned from my sister. So, so shout out if, if she's watching this video and what she has done and done very, very well is something that in my mind, I think about it in terms of a black Friday sale that you're always, you're setting up a watch list. So during the months of, let's say August, September, October, something like that, you're writing down on a list, what your kids need for, as far as clothing for the next year, let's say. But then you're waiting until that Black Friday sale where everything's at a 25% discount. And then you're going out and looking at your watch list when stuff is cheap. And then you're buying whatever it is you need. 
my sister buys stocks the exact same way. And she's been incredibly successful doing so. In fact, I would put her track record over the last five or six years up against anyone. And that includes Stan Druckenmiller or any of these pros. So I like to incorporate that strategy into that 10, 80, 10 portfolio. But I realized that this isn't applicable or this isn't my objectives aren't the same as other people's objectives. And a lot of other people that watch this channel that are part of the rebel capitalist community. So what I'm trying to do is, or well, what I'm not trying, what I am doing is I'm setting up another model portfolio in rebel capitalist pro where I'm going to be pretending or putting my trading hat on where now it's not just about, you know, long-term investing, the Jim Rogers type where you sit back and pretty much do nothing for years on end. And then you just collect yield and T-bills or something like that. And you have your position in gold, you've got your dry powder. And then once every three years, you go ahead and take action when you have some sort of panic. But I'm, I'm going to be continuing that strategy. Absolutely. Because that's a long-term, I think a proven strategy that makes a lot of sense that gives me an edge. But additionally, I'm going to try to think about things in a much shorter time horizon. So it's, it's going to be the same uh, size, $100,000. And by the way, it's real money. It's not like paper trading. <laughs> it's my own money. And uh, I want to more so look at it through the lens of a monthly P&L or profit and loss. To be clear, I have absolutely no experience doing this. None. Zero. Nada. And I will most likely lose money. <laughs> In fact, I'll most likely lose all the money. But I think, I hope, it will be watching me go through this process will help you guys avoid these types of mistakes if you're taking a similar approach where you've got a portion of your portfolio in something that's long-term, but then you're trying to be more proactive on a short-term or mid-term basis to really increase your returns. And another main reason I'm doing this is because when I was growing up, the way everyone knew, the way you increased your purchasing power, you increase your standard of living, you increase your lot in life, as Milton Friedman used to say, was going out there and starting a business. You work your ass off, you take risk, you produce a product or service that the market values more than the money in their back pocket, and you get rewarded. It's a win-win type of relationship. You're getting the money you want, and they're getting the good or service. But in, increasingly, our economy has changed. I'm not saying there's still not opportunity for entrepreneurs out there. There absolutely is. And I think in many categories, many industries, many areas, there's even more opportunities than there was when I was growing up. I mean, this video, YouTube, is a perfect example. But it's, it's, it's changing. It's, it's, it's definitely different. And for the younger generation out there, I see them going into the, the you know, GameStop and chasing these uh, crypto tokens, Dogecoin and Truth Social and all these things. And I, I get it. it. To me, it's like Ben Hunt. He talks about financial nihilism. It makes a lot of sense. But hopefully by me putting this out there and acknowledging not even not that I'm not afraid to make uh, mistakes. I'm taking it a step further. I'm saying I'm likely going to make mistakes and I'm likely going to lose everything. <laughs> because that's just the way it goes. I was listening to the Market Wizards books. Uh, I do this constantly. And I think I mentioned this the other day on a podcast but it, or, or a uh, live stream. But it's just so true. Jack Schwager asked the pro that he was talking to, is trading something you can learn or do you just have to have 
that skill set naturally ingrained from birth. And the gentleman said, it's something you can learn, but it isn't something you can teach. And I thought that was incredibly profound, meaning that if I sat down with a pro, they could teach me some things. Hopefully it would reduce my learning curve, but they can't teach me everything. And it's like life in general, right? I'm sure a lot of you have kids and you can only teach your kids so much. At the end of the day, they have to go out there, take risk. They have to ride their bike. They have to fall down. They have to break their leg. They have to scrape. They have to cut up their elbow in order to learn <laughs> that you can't go around that corner at 35 miles per hour on your bicycle. It's not going to work. Or you can't go down that hill and jump off that dirt mound and play chicken with your buddy like we used to do when I was a kid. We used to take our BMX bikes and we would literally set up boards. We'd set up these jumps of plywood and then we'd you know, stack boards underneath them. So there are two ramps that were facing one another. And each of us, and, and by the way, th this no helmets, no pads, none of that stuff that you see today. Zero, absolutely nada. And each guy would get, you know, 40 feet or whatever on each side of the ramp. And then you'd ride your bike as fast as you possibly could toward the ramp. And then you'd go up the jump headed right at each other. And we just call it chicken. And we used to just do this for fun. And whoever the last guy or whoever the first guy was to fall out of the way because he was too chicken, he didn't want to crash, then that was the loser. And the other guy won. <laughs> you see, now compare that to how kids are raised today. You, you go outside and you see some kid on a bicycle. And it, it, and that's if they do, if they are on a bicycle, I'm sure they've got 45 adults around them supervising. And if they do, they look like they're they're dressed up to go play ice hockey. They've got pads on their elbows, on their knees. They've got a, a helmet that's like this big. <laughs> they've probably got a face shield. They've got eye protective wear. They've got gloves. They've got, I mean, give me a break. Uh, anyway, I'll get off my soapbox there as far as free range parenting or free range children. But uh, back, but my point there, you get it, right? You have to let your kids go out there and make those mistakes. You can only teach them so much. And I think it's the exact same thing in trading. That's why I'm willing to basically lose $100,000 to go through this process to not only teach, to teach me what I need to know outside of what uh, hopefully I can be taught. I keep an open mind. But then also teach you guys and then teach the younger kids out there who gravitate towards Reddit and GameStop and, you know, because this financial nihilism or whatever the most recent cryptocurrency or NFT or Truth Social or any of these meme stocks, if you, can, if you keep doing that, you're going to get burned and you're going to lose everything. There's a way to trade well and trade properly to where you have an edge. But just buying direct call options that expire tomorrow on XYZ meme stock, that's not the way to do it. But I don't think there's a lot of good financial education out there based on the fundamentals. And what I'm referring to is based on the fundamentals that they talk about from the guys that are the OGs, the, the Druckenmillers, the, 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 uh, the, the Jim Rogers, uh, the Michael Steinharts, the Paul Tudor Jones, uh, the Julian Robertson. I mean, these guys were in the, trench, in the trenches. They've been doing this, uh, some of them passed, obviously, but they were doing it for decades. Decades. They are as legit as they come, and they have seen, and they traded and were successful, not only in wild bull markets, like we've seen since 2008. No, no, no. They were successful in the bull markets and the bear markets. They were successful when the economy was doing well and when the economy was in recession. It didn't matter. And what you realize when you read a lot of these books, and I've got uh, one, I've got one of them right there, is 
there are some common denominators that all these guys did well. And it isn't stock picking, believe it or not. We as beginners or amateurs sit back and think, well, what made these guys great was they were able to choose what was going up or what was going down with a great degree of precision or accuracy. Wrong, 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 wrong. Most of these guys were uh, incorrect probably more than 50% of the time. But how did they do it? It's because of all the other variables that nobody pays attention to. And if the young people or all the rebel capitalist community, if you guys can just learn what those guys did right. And again, you can read it in the book. That's one thing. But hopefully it'll really hit home when you see me doing it and you see me losing real money. So you don't have to lose real money yourself to learn the same lessons. Right? So first and foremost, let me give you an idea of what I'm talking about based on numbers, based on numbers. And way back, for most of you who know my backstory, you know that I really got into blackjack in the early 2000s prior to being successful as an entrepreneur. And I credit a, a good portion of my success in making money as an entrepreneur to this book right here. If you guys can't see it, it's Beat the Dealer by Ed Thorpe. You want to talk about an OG. <laughs> you want to talk about some dude that is just an absolute savage. That's Mr. or Dr. Ed Thorpe. Most people know him from beating Blackjack, one of the first people to beat Blackjack. And they also know him for going into the hedge fund business and being just as much of a legend there. But people don't, most people don't realize he also beat roulette. It was, it's a crazy story. He, 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 he built this computer system where as the ball would rotate, he would uh, click this little metal piece that he put in his shoe. And that would give him uh, the area of the board to go ahead and place the bet because you can still place bets when the ball is still spinning. But you got to read the story. It's absolutely incredible. But this was the book that I read way back in the early 2000s. And it quite frankly changed my life. It really did. And I don't know that if I, I don't know that I would have had the financial success that I did to the point where I was able to retire at 38 years old if I would not have read this book and apply these strategies to business. And when I'm talking about the strategies, I'm talking about seeing the world in terms of probabilities. Right. So the very first thing I'm actually. You know what? I'm getting sidetracked. Let me go ahead and we got the screen share going. I'm going to go over one of these, I guess you could call it a calculator that I used to sit there and kind of geek out on for hours on end back in the early 2000s. And this is called a, uh, a binomial calculator. You guys that are a lot smarter than I am probably know what this is. But for those of you who have never used something like this, it's, it's really cool. You sit here and you put in the probability of success. So let's just assume that we're tossing a coin. This heads or tails. Heads or tails. And let's assume for a moment that you have a 51% chance of it landing on heads for whatever reason. Okay. And what I always used to do is play around with these numbers to determine how many, I guess, trials is the word they use. And in business, I used to think about this in terms of lead generation. How many leads would I need to generate in order to make sure that my other numbers were consistent based on the law of large numbers? Let me show you what I'm referring to. So if the number of trials is only 10, Yes, 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 I know. And then the number of successes that we have, so that would be the number of times we uh, flip the coin and we land on heads. Because heads, we have a 51% uh, chance of uh, landing on heads. So then we calculate 
and we can see that we have a 24% probability of getting heads five times. You have a 35% probability of getting uh, uh, fewer than five head flips. You have a 59, almost 60% probability of getting fewer or five. And then you have basically 40 percent chance of getting more than five and a 64 percent chance of getting five or greater okay which makes sense obviously if our percentage our, our probabilities is 51 then the the component or the metric that gives us the 50 percent number or greater should be much higher than the one that gives us the, uh, or the probability of hitting five and greater should be much higher than the probability of hitting five and lower because our odds are 51%, right? Now, obviously, if we change this, let's say to uh, 70, then it's going to be even more extreme. See, now at uh, hitting five or greater, we've got a 95% chance. Hitting less than five, we've only got a 4% chance. Okay, but let's go back to the 51% and play around with the numbers even more. Because at 10%, just as a reminder, we'll focus on losing money here. So what is the, the probability of us losing money if we only bet 10 times or we only flip the coin 10 times? Well, the probability of us actually losing money would be right here, 35%. Okay. So now let's go ahead and take it up to 1,000. And then we'll take this up to 500. Now what's the probability of us losing money? Only 25%. See? Now we go up to 10,000. We go up to 5,000. Now our probability of losing money is only 2%. This is the law of large numbers. And this little simple example with this online binomial calculator explains completely why someone can go in and play blackjack for, a, well, not blackjack, that's a bad example, play a slot machine for a night and they can come out a winner. They can hit the jackpot. But over time, the casino is always going to win. Because if we take, if the casino just has a 51% odds and you have enough spins of that slot machine, they're mathematically, it's impossible for them to lose. Although, if you only have 10 spins of the slot machine, then they might win, they might lose. They have to have the law of large numbers on their side. But this is the exact same thing in trading. It's the exact same thing in investing, quite frankly. Because let's assume for a moment that you can't invest in 10,000 things or you can't take 10,000 bets within the span of a year. Okay, well, how do you give yourself an edge? Well, you'd have to look at the other variables, right? So what would some of these other variables be? Well, you'd have to play around with your probability of winning. It's like we did changing this from 51% up to 7, 70%. Okay, but what if you couldn't do that with a high degree of confidence? Okay, well, then what you would have to do, let's just take this back down to something that's reasonable. Let's say over the span of a year, it's reasonable that you could take, uh, let's just say 100 bets. So now we're at a 38% chance of losing. Okay, well, what we want to do there, and by the way, this is assuming that you win just as much as you lose. So in blackjack, let's, let's back up. I skipped that part, and that's very important. In blackjack, when you make a bet, let's say it's $5, if you lose the hand, you lose the 5 bucks. So in, order, in other words, you lose 100%. 
of your bet, your investment, your trade. Now, if you win that hand, then you get 100%. Or if you get a natural blackjack, the dealer gives you, let's say, an ace and a, and a, and a face card or something, then you get 1.5, or excuse me, you get 150%. You get 1.5 times your bet. And if it's a push, it's a push, right? So basically, you're either losing 100% or you're gaining 100% on every single bet. And that's how I'm coming to the conclusion that based on fixing the win or loss, you would have a 38% chance of losing money if you had a 51% probability of winning and you only placed 100 bets. You got it? Because if you have if you win or lose 50 of those 100, then it's a break even. Okay. So another variable that we can conclude by what I just pointed out is if you had some asymmetry there, meaning that every single time you lost, let's say you only lost 50%, or actually, let's say you lost 100%, but every time you won, you won 150%. You won 1.5 times every single time. Well, now all of a sudden it completely changes, right? So I, I, I can't do the math right in my head because I'm not that smart, but you can see how at 51%, now all of a sudden, if we only win 50 bets, or even if we were to win probably, let's just say 40, out of the 100 times at a 51% probability, we would still come out ahead because if we bet five bucks and we lose, we're losing five bucks. But if we bet five bucks and we win, then let's just say we're making uh, $7.50, right? $7.50. So then, based on those numbers, I could take this down to, let's say, 40. Now let's rework it. Now all of a sudden, you've taken your probability of losing from, what was it, like 34%? All the way down to 1% down to 1% as long as you can bet 100 times with a 51% probability of winning. Just by creating asymmetry with what you win and what you lose. You see how once we work with those variables, then we can come up with a strategy that actually has an edge. But if you sit here and have and, and say, well, I've got an edge of 51%, but I can only bet 10 times, <laughs> you know, then you've got like a 40% chance, let's say, of losing money. And and that's that's not gonna work for me, especially over the long run. So uh it that would be very, very frustrating. And you'd go long periods of time and you theoretically could have quite substantial drawdowns before you make that all back. And there's a lot of swings and fluctuations there. Or like we said earlier, you'd have to bet so many times that it's unrealistic unless you're doing like high frequency trading or something like that. Okay. So let me get back to my variables. I had these written down here for you guys. Okay, so another thing that we've got to uh, consider here is how do we increase the probabilities above and beyond just uh, throwing darts at a dartboard with us to say 50 or 51%. Well, there's things that we can adjust, we can fine tune, right? Such as trend following, such as maybe buying things when they're cheap and selling them when they're expensive. The problem there is that takes a long time for it to play out, right? Let, let's look at, uh, gold miners, or let's say you're a big fan of gold and it's been on a run lately or silver. Okay, great. But how many years did you have to wait for it to do that? And therefore you're not going to be able to place enough bets in order to mathematically have an edge. Well, you might mathematically have a, an edge, but there's a very high probability that over the short run, meaning over years of time, you're going to lose because you're only taking a couple of bets. 
right? I mean, we can take this down to 51% and let's just take it uh, down to six to really take it to an extreme. And then we'll look at three. Now, all of a sudden, you've got a 32% chance of, of losing, right? And that's, that's too high. Uh, so I think you guys understand what I'm saying there in that uh, the, the only way you could employ that type of strategy, meaning just buying things when they're cheap and selling them when they're expensive so you could only take like two or three bets a year, is if you have an extremely high probability of being successful. So going back to the 1080-10, why does that work? Because you're getting paid with 80% of your portfolio. And therefore, you're not in a position where you have to sell. So the probability of you winning, although you might not win huge, is extremely, extremely high. So then what we're doing is we're taking this top number from 51% all the way up to like 90 or 95 because we only have a couple bets, right? But if we're able to employ a strategy where we have more bets, then the probability can go down as long as you have that asymmetry with the amount you win and the amount you lose. So if you really study and understand blackjack, the conclusion you come to when you compare it against trading or the markets is it's far superior way superior. Why is that? Well, number one, the probabilities are defined, right? We're sitting here talking about a 51%. That's unknowable. You don't like, even if you're going long on uranium or silver or Bitcoin or any of these things, it, it's, it's, you don't know what the probability of being right is. You can say, well, it's probably 70, but you don't know if it's 65, 75, 85. You, you really don't have an accurate number to the point where you could dial it in like we're doing here in this binomial calculator. But in blackjack, you can. You see, now I don't know if you guys can see this, but this is just one of the pages where they go over the, based on uh, if you play basic strategy perfectly, what the probability is that you have a winning hand based on what the dealer is showing. So as most of you know that have played blackjack, the dealer's bust hands are when they're showing, or their greatest probability of busting is when they're showing a five or a six. So you can see right here that that's what's giving the player the highest advantage. And then when you're when the dealer is showing an ace or a face card, that's when the player as is at a disadvantage. See, but they're exact numbers. You're not guessing <laughs> with these. And that's one of the main reasons why blackjack is, is absolutely superior in that aspect. The problem with blackjack is if you play well, you get kicked out of the damn casino. <laughs> or what they do is they change the rules. They come in and they add, let's say, uh, 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 an eight-deck uh, uh, card shuffling machine. And so then it's it's very difficult to have the asymmetry in your bet size and what you're losing and what you're winning because you have to fluctuate your bet size based on the count in the deck because that applies to the probabilities of winning when you combine it with playing basic strategy perfectly. You see, so if you, uh, well, I don't want to... I think you guys understand what I'm saying there with blackjack. So again, the problem with blackjack is if you win, you get kicked out of the damn casino. The problem with the stock market is you're not going to get kicked out, but it's impossible to determine the probabilities. But what I'm going to do with this strategy, first and foremost, trust me, this could change in a week. Uh, this is just what I'm starting with because I don't know anything about it. I do know blackjack and I do know the, the concepts behind why it works. So initially what I'm gonna to try to do is just create a trading system that mimics blackjack to the greatest degree. So I wanna to try to figure out, and it'll probably be through options, 
how I can, if I'm placing a bet, how I can place that bet to lose 100% or win 100% with very little in between. Now, I don't know if I can do that. I'm just telling you what I'm going to try to do. And then I'm also going to employ the money management from Blackjack, which back when I was doing it, and I think I'll have to read up on it, but back when I was doing it, it was 30 units. So let's just say we have $100,000. So 30 units would roughly be, what, $3,000? Something like that, 3000 300 or whatever. And so based on that, every single time I make a trade or make a bet, I want to win or lose $3,000. That's what I'm going to be betting. If I'm building this just like Blackjack. Again, this is what I'm starting with, guys. And it, this is just like a business to me. And whenever I started a business, I was always way outside of my comfort zone. I had no clue what I was doing. But just like this YouTube channel is another good example. You have to get off, off the couch and just start and know that you're going to fail. And you just keep throwing stuff up against the wall and seeing what sticks. And whatever sticks, you just do more of that. <laughs> and then whatever doesn't stick, you do less. And then you just keep iterating and iterating and iterating and iterating to the point where you become successful. It's the exact same thing in business, the exact same thing with this YouTube channel, podcast, so I don't see why it would be any different with trading. We'll see, right? We'll see. So anyway, that's what I'm going to do with money management. Now, the uh, the win-loss, we talked about that. So I'm starting with 30 units. I want to try to set up a strategy to where I'm losing or winning 100% each time. And then I want to try to figure out a strategy that will, uh, a way of picking or making bets that will allow me to take quite a few while at the same time giving me above a 50-50 probability of winning. And then once I'm able to establish that, then obviously I want to try to tweak the 51% while understanding that my actual probability is completely unknowable. And therefore, if my range, let's say, on a specific bet is 55 or what I think is 55 to 65, then I have to err on the side of being conservative by making sure that I have enough asymmetry to where I'm still going to win over the long run if that probability is 55% instead of 65%. See, those are the variables, the dials that you've got to try to work with. Another thing that's, uh, by the way, is going to make things extremely challenging is when you're dealing with options, you've got to consider volatility because volatility dramatically impacts the price. Uh, going back to the Market Wizards books, I remember Jack Schweiger interviewing someone that lived through the 1987 crash, Black Monday, and he actually uh, had, he, he bought call options, which is a bet that the market's going to go up, but he actually made money even though the market crashed. Why? because the volatility spikes so high. So this is another variable that's going to make things even more challenging if you're dealing with options above and beyond what we have here in Beat the Dealer. But this is going to be my starting point, just to be very, very clear. So what I'm going to be doing is a webinar on Friday. Uh, these seem to be very popular, so I'll just keep doing them. It's going to be in Rebel Capitals Pro. You can sign up there for a dollar trial. That's georgegammon.com forward slash pro. And I want to go over two things specifically in this webinar. I want to go over uh, what stocks I'm looking at either buying or shorting. And then I also want to go over for more details on the Argentina road trip to freedom and trying to navigate outside of the system using gold, Bitcoin, or silver, and what we're going to be doing in Turkey. We've already planned a second trip. And then I'm going to be going over how I'm going to try to refine and improve this trading strategy that I'm starting with this $100,000 portfolio. 
the main thing that I'm doing, I'll, I'll kind of give you a little secret here, is I'm going back to St. Bart's on Sunday. And I'm going to be spending two weeks in St. Bart's. And I'm going to be, Steve doesn't know this yet, but he knows I'm coming to town. But <laughs> what, what he will find out is I'm going to be spending hopefully all day with him every day, Monday through Friday, watching him trade. And I'm going to be going over some of my ideas that I have with him. And I'm sure 90% of them, he's just going to tell me I'm a, well, we can't use any profanity here. Or I try not to use profanity on this channel, but he's going to tell me I'm a, I'm a freaking moron. <laughs> I know I'm going to hear that over and over and over and over and over again. That's for sure. But that's how, that's how you learn. Uh, I understand that he can't teach me everything. We go back to that profound statement, but hopefully I'll be able to absorb as much as possible. And then what I can't absorb, I'll learn through trial and error. And then what I want to do is live streams, hopefully daily live streams after the market closes or after I'm done hanging out with Steve and kind of download, give you guys what I learned for the day and then what trades I made, uh, what, what I sold or just kind of how things are going with the PL or what epiphanies I've had that I can pass on and share with you guys. So that's how I am changing my investment approach. I'm going to add some layers to it, hopefully evolve a little bit and take you guys along with me on that journey and on that adventure. And if you want more details, uh, go ahead and go over to georgegammon.com, uh, sign up, and we'll see you on that webinar. We'll probably do 2 p.m. Eastern time this Friday.